It is Friday, October 12th, let's talk PlayStation. Now getting right into it, PlayStation Network ID name changes are finally official. So let's recap this really quickly because this moved so rapidly throughout the past week and a half, more or less. And starting from that point about a week and a half ago, you remember I did that PSN ID name changes video where I cataloged the history of why Sony's never given you this feature. But near the end of that video, I had mentioned, uh, you know, I think the feature is finally coming soon. A few days later, there was that rumor coming out of Kotaku. There were four separate developers at, you know, four separate studios contacted Jason Schreier, anonymously, of course, confirming that they are preparing for this feature. And this is a situation where developers would have to support it, actually. Uh, and then we talked about it last week on Let's Talk PlayStation. And uh, again, I said, well, it's got to be coming soon, right? Boom, here we are today. Well, really, it was announced a few days ago, but... Uh, on the PlayStation blog, they've confirmed that PlayStation Network ID name changes are official. They're actually going into an early preview program in November, so this will be opened up to a select amount of users, actually the same amount of users that are typically involved in PS4 firmware betas. So these same people are going to be testing the ID name change. So here are the actual details. First ID change is going to be free. Anything thereafter is $10 US or Canadian. If you are a PlayStation Plus subscriber, you can cut that price in half down to $4.99. Here's the big caveat. So basically this feature will work on any game that was published after April 1st, 2018. Anything prior to that, Sony is saying that most commonly played PS4 games should support it as well and they will release a list of games that will support the ID change, but they are more or less saying that there are still many titles on PS4 and very likely most PS3 and Vita games I'd have to imagine. Uh, there's a very likely scenario where you could get into those games maybe play online or something and the game may have a serious error or issue and that is why sony is also giving giving you the ability to revert to your old name if you have to for free as well uh, we'll get back to that in a second the other thing is that what you can also do is that when you do change your id you have the option of displaying your old name to show your friends that that's you know you've got a new name and that was your previous one the weird thing here is that they're saying if you change your name and you choose the option to display your old one as well, you can't change that again. So after you've chosen to display your old name, you can't, at, after a certain amount of time, once your friends know that's you, you can't get rid of the, the old ID anymore. <laughs> they're just giving you another ultimatum. Well, what is going on? God forbid somebody changes their name and they say, oh, you know what, I'm going to leave my old one on there. You can't get rid of it again. <laughs> what is, does nobody, like, I'm, I read that and I'm like, does nobody else see that? Uh, but maybe if you change it, like, let's say you pay again, maybe you'd have, again, the option to display the old one. And would it be your original, original one? Which I'd have to imagine it would be the very original one and not the previous one. This is already getting super muddy. Getting back to the games thing, though, this very much so confirms that this is a situation where Sony could not retroactively fix the network. This is just something that games have to support now, which is crazy. And uh, I think they just came to a point where they just figured, you know what, we got to do it. If we're going to do this, if, if we can't fix the network, we got to start it now. That way, not too many people get harmed trying to play older experiences, right? Now we can just, from this point forward, April 1st, 2018, any PS4 game and obviously PS5, etc., so on and so forth, you should be in the clear. Because I, another thing is that this is this is going to be mandated with developers, much like uh, something like trophy support. It's mandated. You can't make a game and not give it trophies. You have to. So Sony's probably mandating the support for ID ID changes. So this is this is not something they could have fixed just under the floor, which is crazy. Because now, and what I'm wondering is what would happen trying to play older games, you know what I mean? Um, that's certainly a, a good experiment to test, and we certainly will do that on this channel. Now, going into our next news story, you can file this one under yes, but also what? Borderlands 2 was announced for PlayStation VR, which you would think is a really cool announcement if you're into VR and if you're into Borderlands. However, two big caveats, one being that the game does not have co-op, which that's what Borderlands was founded upon, basically. And number two, it's not really clear that there's aim support. I, essentially, I would assume there is no aim support because if there was, it would be a marquee headlining feature of this game and the trailer would include a move controller and some guy having a good time. So it appears as though there's no aim support, which I find really puzzling because like you'd see an announcement like this and you would think right away, oh, Borderlands 2, that's perfect. I love the co-op in that game. 
I have a mo uh, an aim controller. This works out perfectly because it's a first person shooter with tons of guns. Uh, but no, that's not the case. So it just seems like an incredibly missed opportunity because this is like, it's like a perfect game for this, you know? You look at something like Farpoint, and Farpoint was great for what it was, but it's like a really bad game if it wasn't virtual reality. Borderlands 2 is a great game, so you need more, I, I honestly think you need more proof of concept games like this. Like, yeah, a lot of developers and Sony themselves and, and Oculus, they all preach that VR experiences should be built for the ground up in VR, which you would assume is an original game, a brand new IP, or just a brand new game in general. But I think it's important for us to probably go back and cherry pick some of the best games that people have loved so much and show them what a first person virtual reality experience can do, which is that uh, really sells the concept of why VR is so incredible. So a game like Borderlands 2, I thought, this is perfect, but now you've just dropped the ball on two of the biggest things that would have sold this. Now this next one I found rather interesting, a Reset Arrow forum user had noticed a job listing at Quantic Dream for a PC engineer programmer with excellent experience in Direct 3D 11 and 12, which is a Microsoft program for development on Windows and Xbox, so this has led a pretty big conversation as to if Quantic Dream's next game or next project is possibly going to be multi-platform, where it would be available on PS4, Xbox, PC, well really, I think it's almost fair to say that their next project would probably be a uh, next gen, but would they go multi-platform? I mean, they are an independent developer. They can, in theory, make a game wherever they choose to do so. Um, a lot of people are bringing up a three-game contract thing. I've never heard of that with them. As far as I know, they've still been contract per contract with uh, with Sony. They have are considered a second-party developer, so you know, Sony funds each specific title that they do, and of course Sony publishes each game, and Sony holds the uh, intellectual property rights to each specific game. So if Sony wants to make a Heavy Rain 2 or Detroit Become Human 2, they can do it without uh, Quantic Dream. Although Quantic Dream has actually been open in saying that they might actually pursue a sequel if they uh, feel that there's more stories that can be told in the Detroit Become Human universe. Now the one thing that I'm thinking of, quite honestly, and you gotta understand the time frame of where we are right now, they just wrapped up Detroit Become Human, it takes years to push one video game out. They're more than likely not going to release another PS4 game. You gotta figure their next project is next gen. Um, and their long relationship with Sony is quite a strong one. They've been there every, you know, they've been there for the last two generations now showing off a, uh, a tech demo on Sony's hardware. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I'm thinking that they're probably working on um, new, new, a new engine of some sort. Uh, I mean, they still need to work on PC more or less to make things uh, available on PlayStation. Uh, it's not totally unheard of. And again, surely, yes, they could go multi-platform, but uh, I honestly, I'm thinking that they're probably just, they're not even really gearing up for a, a new game at all. They're, they're probably working on either a new engine or a new tech demo for, um, for possibly even showing off at the PS5 announcement. You know, who knows when that's going to be, uh, they could, it could take them, you know, six months to a year to make a vertical slice of some sort of tech demo to be demonstrated later. Uh, it takes a long time to make, uh, you know, your own unique engine. So there's a really, there's a lot of avenues of where this could go. Now, while on the topic of job listings, another conversation that came up this past week was about Guerrilla Games' recent hires. Actually, they hired two recent uh, Ubisoft staff that were on the Rainbow Six Siege team. So this has kind of sparked the conversation of, well, these two guys are from a uh, game that was a first-person shooter. The one hire in particular was a multiplayer designer, so we know that Guerrilla Games' recent title was Horizon Zero Dawn, which is a single-player RPG, and their other games that they've done is Killzone, and that's a first-person shooter with multiplayer. So, uh, you know, is Guerrilla Games going back to uh, Killzone, for example? Are they doing another Killzone? Now, studio co-founder Herman Hulse has already told us the ambitions for the studio long-term, and we know that for 2019, the studio is going to be moving into bigger office space, going from a staff of 250 up to 400, and working on two games at the same time. They do want to do this. And actually, they want to do a new IP and an existing franchise under their belt. Now, I think it's fair to say that they're very likely going to do a Horizon 2, because it was such a knockout success. Which kind of implies that well, the new IP wouldn't be wouldn't be Killzone. It'd be a new IP because technically Horizon is now an existing IP. Like let's face it, we're gonna get Horizon 2. That's got to be the existing IP, unless they are gonna do Killzone and Horizon concurrently. But I don't I don't think that the studio is going to do that because of how well Horizon did. I think the studio does want to flex its muscles a little bit and try something new on top of Horizon. Now that's not to say they won't ever do Killzone again. However. 
the recent staff of first-person shooter talent could imply that the new IP could be a, a different first-person shooter. That's not outside the realms of impossibility. We know that the company is deeply rooted in that genre, so maybe they could give a crack at an entirely different idea that isn't Killzone, which I would certainly be open to. But whatever it is, much like the Quantic Dream scenario, we will not find out about that for a very long time. So check this one out. A recent filing shows that Sony is actually suing a hacker, a PlayStation 4 hacker. This guy actually makes modded PlayStation 4 consoles. He's been selling them on eBay and they're jailbroken actually. So they have a lot of pirated games. I guess the guy's website links to a number of, you know, modded consoles that he sells and he claims how he's been doing this since 2006 and he says never buy games again. Here's all these pirated games, blah, blah, blah. So what's funny is that Sony actually purchased two of these consoles from him on eBay and they got the return address so they knew where he was and you know like <laughs> so they they really went mob deep into this to find this guy and yeah so they're actually suing him um the actual claim against the defendant is the infringement of first party copyrights infringing ps program code the distribution of jailbroken ps4s and in the filing specifically sony interactive entertainment believes the defendant's actions were knowing deliberate willful and in complete disregard of SIE's rights. I mean, normally, in situations like this, I'd say a cease and desist letter usually does the job, because what damages are they really expecting to gain out of a single individual when Sony is a multi-billion dollar corporation? I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know what they're trying to really get out of this. Maybe to prove a point, I don't know. Maybe that is the case. Maybe they're just trying to make an example out of this guy. To be fair, most jurisdictions have already agreed that jailbreaking is totally legal and it's within consumer rights. But certainly the pirating is not, and that is where this guy will more than likely not be protected whatsoever, and he's probably going to lose his ass off. Now, for our final news story, it's exciting, and it's also unexciting at the same time, but Sony has finally given us our first official confirmation that they are working on a next-generation console. So actually, Sony CEO Kenichiro Yoshida was talking to the Financial Times, and he was quoted as saying, At this point, what I can say is it's necessary to have next-generation hardware. And that's it. He didn't really say anything else. He didn't say anything about a name or hardware specifics. He wouldn't, of course, answer many questions regarding this topic, but essentially, yes, next generation hardware is in the works at Sony Corporation, at Sony Interactive Entertainment, which is, it's exciting because, again, this, it's acknowledgement, right? We know that they've been working on PS5 or whatever it's going to be called. I would assume it's PS5 for their four consoles deep. Four was the scary number. A lot of people were like, oh my God, it's not gonna be called four. Sure enough, it was still called PS4. So I don't think they're not gonna call it this thing PS5. Um, but typically with hardware manufacturers, they start the early conceptual stages of their next hardware a year after their previous hardware. And that's at the very earliest. Sometimes at the latest, it's you know two years. PS4 came out 2013. PS5 was certainly in discussion as early as 2014 like at the latest 2015 right so ps5 has certainly been, been a thing for for a while and we've been talking about it for a while too i mean there's actually been plenty of rumors regarding playstation 5 and that's the fact that sony's working very close with amd and not only a cpu but a gpu as well um and there's been a number of patents floating around um it's it's certainly out there right this idea of what next gen is going to look like it's out there and there's actually more microsoft rumors nowadays than there is sony and that's mostly because microsoft has been more open about talking about it we we have heavy rumors about xbox scarlet and microsoft's confirmed that it's you know they're going to do a streaming box uh, that they're going to do a more traditional based hardware they, they have this streaming service that they're really going to try and push on the consumer and and they think they've got the latency down pretty good, you know? I mean, they've got a pretty good idea of what they're doing here. And more specifically with this news story, the Financial Times is reporting that they have sources very close saying that uh, PS5 is gonna be more of the same, and they're referring to the architecture. And this is what we've been talking about for a while too, which is that Sony very deliberately chose x86 for a reason with PS4. They are future-proofing it, and I think Again, we talk about it so much, but PS3 was such a, like, they learned so much from it. And they learned not to make PlayStation Network such a pain in the ass. They learned not to use the cell processor ever again, you know, because they want to do all these things today that they can't provide to us because of the decisions they made 12 years ago, or really uh, 14, 15 years ago when they were making PlayStation 3, when they were designing PlayStation Network. Um, you know, PS4 is the complete opposite of that. And so... Yes, I mean, PS5, it's probably going to be x86. It's going to have, you know, the same somewhat highly customized AMD GPU and CPU. But this is going to allow Sony to more than likely achieve backwards compatibility much easier than they could before 
having to go the route of system on a chip or emulation. We might just get native, we might just natively get backwards compatibility. This is why PS4 and PS4 Pro is a situation where that works. You can put a PS4 disc in either one and that system's gonna read it and understand it properly and it's gonna be fine. That's the same thing with Microsoft. It's still miraculous that both these companies came up with the same idea to go with x86 moving forward. But if there's two major things to take away from this new story, it's that there still has to be something that Sony has to do. I don't think they can be super traditional with this. We're at a point of diminishing returns in terms of graphics, uh, graphical fidelity, uh, frame rate resolution, you know. We're seeing, we're seeing some games hit 4K 60 frames, of course not a lot, hardly many. Uh, and that still may not even be a standard today, but again, time and time again, developers are still going to push graphics further than they will, say, the frame rate or the resolution. They can do that. They can sacrifice a lower frame rate or resolution to give you um, improved graphics. That is a thing that people, that developers do, and it's a common theme in the games industry with game consoles. People go, oh, they're too underpowered. No, developers just keep choosing to lower these other things to increase these other things. I think PS5 has to have some sort of a shtick, and I don't mean a gimmick, I mean there's just, there has to be something else that pulls people in. Uh, whether that's an extremely optimized user interface or maybe some sort of hybrid c controller that allows it to be played on the go, maybe, you know what I mean? Like, I know that's super far-fetched, but, you know, things like PlayStation Now or just a better graphics performance, you know, I mean... They, I think they, they need to do a little bit more, and Microsoft's going the streaming route. We know that Sony's got streaming, but I would like to see more out of it. And the other point I wanted to bring up was that because we have our first official acknowledgement, this is really where you're going to, you know, we're going to see it now, you know. 2019 is going to be pretty interesting. I think you could certainly see a PS5 formal announcement late 2019. I think that at the earliest, I think we can all agree that the system's going to launch in 2020. I can't see it launching later than that or earlier than that, certainly. But I think you could be in a scenario where we, we would see it announced late 2019. And that's just announced, you know? So we get, we get like, Last of Us Part Two release, Days Gone release, Ghost of Tsushima hopefully released by holiday 2019. But even then, it's not a big problem if PS5 exists in terms of an announcement and a PS4 exclusive releases after that fact. That's not a problem. There's crossover. Uh, so that's going, to, that's going to be a thing. Um, you know, the announcement is still going to take another... 8 to 12 months of the console being released after the fact. So you could see an announcement. Um, but this is uh, the precipice of it for sure. Now getting into Let's Talk Plus, our weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you could win a $10 PlayStation Network code. I'm trying to give away codes to you people. Anyway, the winner from last week was Mohamed Salah. Congratulations. I will be contacting you on Twitter, buddy. Respond back to my direct message to make sure that I, so I know that you got the message and I will send you your $10 code. If you would like to win a $10 PlayStation Network code, follow the link down below. It takes you to the Gleam website. All you gotta do is subscribe to the channel. You could follow me on Twitter. You could retweet a tweet that I put out. That will probably be about um, the recent video I did earlier this week. So not LTPS. But um, come on, homies. I'm trying to give you some codes. I'm trying to give you some codes. Anyway, <laughs> those are some of the news stories that I want to talk about with you guys from this past week. And like I just mentioned, good segue. Um, this Tuesday, I upload a video about the top 100 most sold PS4 games. So... If you look at the top 100 games, it's an interesting list for a number of reasons. And, you know, the first part is going over the 100 games, but the second part is actually the bulk of that video is understanding what that list means, what developers are doing, what people are buying. Um, really good video. I think you should check it out. Of course, I'm biased here. I made the video, but, you know, can, can you blame me? And just an FYI, I know so many people enjoyed the PS4 documentary. Yes, I am writing and currently working on the next one, but you know, I've told you those things take gosh darn long to make so um i can't and that's probably going to be like november for sure that you'll see um the next documentary come out however oh boy you all are gonna love this video i'm telling you and i don't know why i said y'all in a very weird I, I don't know why i pronounced it so weird i'm not southern i actually live in live in western new york Ooh, this is rough i'm really <laughs> i'm really messing up now and i i can't afford to keep re-recording things because i'm running out of time here so that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Badecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you guys next Friday.